Testing, one, two, testing. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Terry Mokri, and I'd like to welcome you all on this beautiful spring Gray County Day. We ask those of you who can, if you'd please stand and join in the singing of our national anthem. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free from far and wide. Stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard. Thank you. As we begin our celebration of Agnes Campbell McPhail this afternoon, we'd like to formally recognize that we are meeting on Anishinaabe traditional territory. Springtime in Gray County. The first sightings, yesterday I saw my first robin. As we were driving, as we were driving here this morning past Lake Eugenia, I noticed the trumpeter swans are back. Also in the front lawn, there was a gathering of starlings yesterday, and they were all yelling at each other, wondering whose bright idea was it to come this far north so soon. Also, I noticed that our tulips and daffodils, the first peeking of the little green heads coming out of the soil, screaming and wishing they could get back inside again. And the maple trees, the sap running, Maple trees all, ups, all upset and disgusted because it's not going up the trunks all the way. Yes, it's springtime in Gray County and we love every moment of it. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to also welcome you this morning, this afternoon, and thank you for being here on this typical Gray County spring day as we celebrated a belated birthday, a belated birthday of Agnes Campbell McPhail not too belated, just two days and 133 years later. We've gathered together this afternoon to continue our learning about Agnes Campbell McPhail and to celebrate her birthday and to honor two local women with whom, whom most of you know already. But first, permit me to read a background note from Barry Penhale. When Agnes McPhail's staunchest Toronto booster, Lee Sider, Edna, Benji passed on a great, uh, at, at a great age a few years ago. Family members donated her substantial collection of McPhail em, um, ephem, ephemera, thank you, oh, ephemera to Barry. He had known uh, Benji first as an e East York counselor during his Toronto years, and this most unexpected gift was indeed welcome. Among the finds that were donated and new to Barry was a copy of a December 31st, 1932 newspaper article, which was entitled, Agnes, Where Art Thou Going? The article was written by one of Canada's foremost journalists at the time. He was much, the much-loved Gregory Clark. Clark notes that it was not himself, but his photographer, Tom Wilson, that Agnes watched most closely when they arrived to interview her at her Ceylon home. His explanation was, this was so because Agnes McPhail MP hates cameras. They do her dirt. Clearly, McPhail anticipated the usual line of question, questioning to be solely focused on her political career. But she didn't know Clark and the story he was after. His goal was to get Agnes to talk about herself. And I quote, we're not gonna talk politics, Miss McPhail. 
Then Clark reminded Agnes that, and we quote again, she was one of interest to tens of thousands of people who had never before given her so much as a passing glance. They want to know about you. How did you get this way? Then he stated, Agnes McPhail told us the story with not a little wonderment. She had never looked back over her life before. She thought things just came, but they didn't. When Gregory Clark asked, what did you dream about as a girl? Agnes went away on a journey of memory before their eyes. She spoke slowly and hesitantly, and I quote, I was the oldest in the family. There were no boys. I had to be the boy. I brought home the cows across the fields. It was I that had to catch the horse and harness it. Maybe that has something to do with it. I remember now the book I read, she said, one, the one book we all read, Sarah K. Bolton's Lives of Famous Men and Women. I remember being so impatient with the famous women. The most a woman could do was have someone who would do great things for her, like Lord Salisbury, or have daughters who would have sons. I remember that now distinctly. I can remember going around those fields, bringing home the cows, and dreaming of doing something great. I suppose all girls dream like that. There is more to that story, but for another time. Thank you, Barry, for the words. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and thank our local historian, a man of letters, a publisher, an organizer, and an all-round good guy, Mr. Barry Penhale. We are honored today to have with us a number of distinguished, distinguished guests, friends actually, representing the various communities which make up Gray County and which make it a very special place to live in. Please welcome as he presents greetings our good friend and member of parliament for Bruce Gray Owen Sound, Mr. Alex Ruff. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Now I'm going to go off script right off the get-go here because um, we have something we've been trying to present for a while to two key individuals that are instrumental in today's events and just pillars of the community and that is Barry and Jane. So Barry and Jane, I don't know if you can, guys can come forward if you're, you're able um, and I'm going to make a small presentation to you. So as many of you know, last year, uh, we, with, uh, in celebration of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, I called for nominations and, and Barry and Jane were both, uh, were both nominated. So I'm just going to read this out real quick. As the Member of Parliament for Bruce Gray Owen Sound, I'm honoured to present Barry and Jane with a Platinum Jubilee coin to recognise your service to our community. Your work in public history has served a great community service to preserve and highlight local stories. This is exemplified through your work as the uh, Natural Heritage Book owners, with the, as well with the South Gray Museum board members and volunteers, the Emancipation Festival contributions, and Agnes McPhail uh, recognition volunteers. You play a pivotal role in Gray Highlands as community contributors, promoters, entertainers, and organizers, especially your role in putting on a Canada Day breakfast. During Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee year, nations across our Commonwealth are ce celebrating the achievements of exemplary citizens. In light of this, I'm honoured to recognise the example you have both set for others. Congratulations on this tremendous achievement, and on behalf of all constituents, thank you for the difference you have made to Bruce Gray on sound. Uh, Mr. Roth gets to know better uh, 
those people who make up his writing, he will have discovered that we are a great bunch of volunteers. Uh, so I accept this, and Jane does, on behalf of all of you, because we know the wonderful work that's done by so many people we see in this room. And those of you we do not know that well, I know you're doing your part too. So uh, uh, we accept it in, in that vein, and thank you so much. Thank you. Look, on behalf of the whole riding uh, from the federal perspective, I, I do want to thank everybody for coming today and, and recognizing Agnes. Uh, every year I get to learn just a little bit more about Agnes McPhail and just truly the tremendous achievements and the trailblazer that she was in, especially for women here in Canada. And it, it's, the, it's one of the there's a small bust of her. I, I think some of you would have saw the video that I, I shot uh, last year in recognition of her, but it's at the entrance to Parliament in Ottawa, and it's just a great example for that first uh, woman elected to our federal parliament. She, you know, she served with the League of Nations. She just was a truly impressive trailblazer. Yesterday, many of us uh, on the elected side were in Katy, at the Bruce and Gray Federation of Agriculture Politicians meeting. And, you know, it just speaks to the roots here because Agnes was, uh, she was noted there yesterday in, in the remarks as well, because that's one of the key things that she was a huge advocate, not just for women uh, in, in getting, you know, everybody sort of that equal voice, but she stood up greatly for farmers and our community across uh, this great riding. So again, I just want to thank you all for continuing to shine a light on the great uh, history, or the great, you know, sort of challenger, not challenges, but the uh, difference that Agnes made. And the best way we can uh, to do is to remember her and learn from, learn from history. So thanks again for having me today, and thanks everybody for being part of it. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Alex may have to leave, is actually he's going to have to leave shortly because he has to catch a flight back to Ottawa because rumor is that Justin Trudeau may even show up someday. <laughs> Bringing Ontario greetings from our member of Provincial Parliament for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. He will be speaking about the annual presentation and the special recognition of Agnes in East York, Toronto. Please welcome our very staunch supporter and friend, Rick Byers. Well, thank you, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here at, uh, at, at the birthday of our, our beloved Agnes. And um, I wanted to bring greetings uh, on behalf of the province and on behalf of uh, the, the uh, Toronto connection that, that she had later in her life. And I, I want to also reflect a little bit on, you know, my reaction to that beautiful presentation of No Better Roses introduced by the Friends of the South Grey uh, Museum, I think, last fall. And I must say, certainly having heard about Agnes, but hearing her story directly uh, was quite impactful. I, after the event, uh, not right after, but after I made my way to her home in Ceylon and I saw it and uh, it's got a pla I didn't go inside, um, but it's a lovely, beautiful historical building and saw her grace, grave site in, in Priceville. And she had a huge impact on Queen's Park. Not only was she the first female MP, but she was one of the first two elected representatives in the provincial uh, legislature. And uh, like in the, in the House of Commons, the, there's a bust of her outside the speaker's office, actually, if you go in the east door. And 
When I'm uh, down in Toronto, uh, I assure you, I prefer to be here in Gray County, but uh, when I have to go down there, my office is in the Frost Building, so I come in the east door every morning, and I see her bust, and it's also there's several pictures of Agnes and several of the other first women who were there, amazing women at, uh, at Queen's Park. So that's a great inspiration every day. And members of provincial parliament are allowed to make a statement in the House every kind of month or so, and I got my turn, and I made my statement about Agnes McPhail. In fact, I should have sent it on uh, uh, you know, I've been busy, well, I, I will send it on if I got it, but it was, I reflected to the legislature about her amazing achievements and her, her, the history she made, but most importantly, the incredible courage I felt she had. Imagine back in 19, uh, early 1900s of, of being a woman uh, going into that environment, both federally and provincially, enormous courage. and. My colleagues in the legislature gave, gave Agnes a standing ovation uh, along. So it was a great, great memory and a real uh, impact for me personally. So thank you so much for all you're doing to keep her memory alive. And what a great, great county lady and a great, great Canadian. So thank you very much. Good to see you all. Thank you, Rick. The uh, current county warden and, of course, mayor of Southgate will be here to reflect upon the role that Proton delegates played in Agnes's winning of the 1920, 1921, yes, it was 1921 nomination for a federal candidate for Southeast Grey. This is a man who is always willing to lend a hand. He's our neighbor from the south. Brian Mill. But before Brian comes up, I'd also acknowledge the presence today of Joan John, who is a counselor, the first female counselor from, from South, uh, Southgate, and also Barbara Debreen, who is the deputy mayor of Southgate, too. We welcome both of you and thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to be with us. Brian, please. Thank you, Terry. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of today's event. I'm, uh, as Terry said, I'm the Great County Warden, Brian Milne, and I'm proud to bring greetings on behalf of Great County Council to everyone today. We're here to honor and uh, celebrate Agnes McPhail, who has been referred to as the most important Canadian women in public life in the 20th century, notwithstanding my own deputy mayor in the front row here. But for good reason. Over 100 years ago, she made history, of course, as the first Canadian woman to be elected to the House of Commons. Um, I'm, I'm also, as was mentioned, the mayor of the Township of Southgate, and I'm extremely proud to represent the community where Agnes was born, which was, of course, or is, of course, it's the former township of Proton. Agnes was very proud of her rural Proton and Gray County roots, and Gray County is proud of her and the path she blazed. Coming from a farming family, as so many of us do, Agnes spoke honestly and openly about the issues affecting rural communities. Well, this really resonated with folks, and when she opened her campaign as candidate for the United Farmers of Ontario for the riding of Southeast Grey at the town hall in Durham, the town of Durham, not the region, don't get that mistake, the meeting was packed. She told the crowd, I'm not here to smile at men and kiss babies. She was there to support farmers and ensure that her hard work was recognized, their hard work, and uh, their, their hard work was recognized and respected. And when you look at the election results from that nomination meeting, the rural townships come out to support her too. Now, I can only speculate what went on at that nomination meeting or how the Proton delegates felt when they realized the next morning what they had done. Certainly pride, I suspect, in the fact that not only had they elected a woman to represent them, but someone who spoke for them, not to them. 
In Greene County, we don't just admire Agnes McPhail for what she achieved. We admire her because she embodied so many of the qualities we hold dear. She was strong and passionate. She was resilient and courageous. She was determined. Agnes not only gave women a, vo women a voice in politics, she inspired generations after her to stand up for what they believed to be right. Thank you to the organizers of today's event for continuing to draw attention to this important anniversary. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of honoring the wonderful uh, Agnes McPhail. Happy birthday, Agnes. Thank you very much, Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want at this point to ask you to please welcome the mayor of Grey Highlands, Paul McQueen. We're not going to let him speak, though. <laughs> Actually, Paul will be doing, is, is part of the program and is doing a presentation a bit later on. So at that time, he will present greetings and also he has a bit of a job to do. Ladies and gentlemen, on this special celebratory day, the Friends of South Grey Museum ask you to join in as we honour two local women who, much in the tradition of Agnes McPhail, have contributed much to the betterment of our community and who actually share historical links with Agnes. Our first honoree is Margaret Jean McCannell who was born and raised on a farm in Proton Township, not far away from Agnes's home farm, a log homestead. Her connection to Agnes is somewhat tenuous, but nonetheless, there are few people alive today who can remember the physical presence of Agnes Campbell McPhail. Jean recalls that when she was young and working in Hills, at Hills Emporium in Dundalk, that Agnes McPhail came in to shop with her niece. Jean, who was observing near the counter, remembers an obvious but respectful buzz spreading out throughout the store. Agnes McPhail is here. In the late 1940s, she met a dapper Bill Hutchison, all the way, all the way from Artemisia Township. They were married in 1953, they settled on Lakeside Farm, where they still are today, and raised a family of three, two sons and a daughter. Almost immediately, despite the demanding life of a farmer's wife, Jean became a community volunteer, writing for some time a local society column for three newspapers, one in Dundalk, one in Flesherton, and of course one in Markdale. About 40 years ago, she initiated the Friends of the Flesherton Library during the early years of Wilda Allen's tenure, tenure there. She volunteered once a week at the hospital in Markdale, held various roles as a member of the Hold Fast Society in Ceylon, a society that had been established by Agnes Campbell McPhail. In the 1950s, she and her supportive husband, Bill, took on a major role with Flesherton's once annual Split Rail Festival. Part of the volunteering involved participating in various antique shows across southern Ontario, thus ensuring reciprocal participation for the Split Rail event. Now we know that after some years, and when ill health intervened, they retired. Two years later, the event ceased to be, which may be a tip of the hat to the hard work they had been doing to that point. In 2013, Jean became a founding member of the Friends of the South Grey Museum. She participated in the planning of numerous events and took on the role of Agnes at our special birthday ga gatherings, such as this one today. Jean published a book on Flesherton's beloved Elizabeth Nunn, who, run a, who ran a midwifery home known as Nunn's Nursing Home. And in 2018, she delivered a presentation on Midwife Nunn for a Friends Agnes event. Now, Jean was supposed to bring the book so I could show you, so you can just imagine this beautiful book 
and I have a copy of it, as do a lot of us, and it was an amazing story of local history. In 2020, Jean, nominated by Wilda Allen, was awarded the Heritage Certificate of Recognition by the Gray County Historical Society. Regrettably, COVID prevented any public presentation. Today, we honor Jean Hutchison, who, much in the tradition of Agnes McPhail, embodies McPhail's attributes, service to the community, hard work, and perseverance. Before she stands up, let's just give Jean a hand of applause. Stand up, Jean, and then we'll continue. I'm going to do a formal presentation in a minute, but we're going to talk about our second honoree at this time, too. Wilda Jean White was raised on a farm on the South Line, just to the west of Priceville, close to the former Top Cliff Stone Schoolhouse. The second daughter in a family of three girls and three boys, she grew up, she grew up knowing the value of hard work and of being supportive to each other. Her early years were also influenced by her blood relationship to Agnes McPhail. Wilda's paternal great-grandmother, Edith Campbell, was a first cousin of Jean Campbell, Agnes's beloved grandmother. With a ready supply of books to read always on hand at home, it's no surprise that Wilda was eager to learn and was leaning towards a career in elementary school teaching. However, marriage and motherhood would intervene. It was after a most tragic accident took the life of her husband that Wilda sold the farm, took her children and herself, her two children, to Flesherton to start anew. On September 1st, 1980, as a new employee, she entered the Flesherton Public Library, then located on the house on Elizabeth Street. It was a first step towards an over 40-year career as a librarian, culminating in her retirement in December of 2022. From her role, role as Chief Executive Officer and Chief Librarian of the Gray Highlands Public Library System, a system that includes branches in Kimberley, Markdale, and Flesherton. During the early years, Wilda much appreciated the mentorship of Geraldine Robinson, then chair of the library board. Hard work became the motto of the days to come as she attended multiple library courses, meetings, and conferences dedicated to enhancing her skills. Along the way, she met Paul Allen, then of Proton Station, and he came a long way from Proton Station to Flesherton. They married, settled in a home to the east of Flesherton, and raised a family of four girls. Today, they are loving grandparents. Wilda's career demonstrates a commitment to hard work, a desire to learn, willingness to work cooperatively with other organizations, and a passion to make things better for the community. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now ask Wilda and Jean to please come forth so we can do a little presentation and acknowledge the, their contributions. Let's give them a round of applause. of the township of Artemisia 
and more recently the municipality of Grey Highlands. These hours of service reflect the true meaning of Agnes McPhail, MP for Grey Counties, um, who was a political icon who in 1921 was elected as the first Canadian woman to take a seat in the House of Commons. Jean recognized the needs of her community and acted selflessly to respond to those needs. Her commitment to and her ability to listen and learn and in turn turn those list, that listening and learning into words of action reflect the attributes bestowed upon us by Agnes McPhail. We thank you, G. On this, the 26th day of March 2023, we gathered as the United Church, Markdale, Ontario, on the traditional territory of the Mission Abbey to observe our heartfelt tribute to Wilda Allen of Great Highlands, Great County. We are pleased to be honoring Wilda Allen this afternoon as a woman who, in the admirable tradition of Agnes Campbell McPhail, has committed countless, countless hours of service, initially to the betterment of the township of Art Artemisia and more recently to the municipality of Grey Highlands. These, uh, these hours of service reflect the true meaning of Agnes McPhail, MP for Grey County's political, political icon, who in 1921 was elected the first Canadian woman to take a seat in the House of Commons. Whether consciously or not, during her career as a librarian, Wilda demonstrated Many of the attributes of Agnes McPhail, hard work, doing her homework, including teaching of children, and these are all a great part of the responsibility she had, and of course being responsible to the needs of the community. We thank Wilda. Congratulations to both of our recipients. Jean, do you want to say a few words at this time? Come and step up here. don't know what to say. I'm not, I'm wondering if you got the right person here or not for <laughs> all the wonderful things you were saying about me. But I'd like to say that I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I did a lot of speaking on Agnes and I learned a lot of things about her and she was really a wonderful woman. There is other wonderful women in the community too, but Agnes, I think she was top. And uh, uh, it's really nice that we're uh, showing our appreciation to her because she worked hard and served her life for us. Thank you. Wilda, please come up. Yep, thank you. 
So Jane said just to say a few words, so I was really happy about that. So these, this is just a few words. Um, I must say, um, um, as Jean said, I was very surprised when I was informed that I'd be one of the two women to be recognized today. I'm still kind of emotional for the, what you read about me, Terry. That's, it was so lovely um, at this event. And when Jane called me up um, and she said she wanted to talk to me about the event, and that um, Jean Hutchinson was going to be recognized, and I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Jane's going to ask me to introduce Jean. <laughs> so, and then she said um, they would like to recognize me as well. So I feel extremely humbled, um, and it's 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 an absolute honor to be here today, as we celebrate um, the, an event for such an important figure, who mar who made such a mark in Canadian history. And I do congratulate Jean. Um, you are so worthy of of the honor today. I did mention at the mayor's levy, and I want to say it again today, that my term as a CEO of the library <clears throat> was definitely not, all the wonderful things that happened and any of the accomplishments were never mine alone. Um, they were also accomplished with, they could not have been accomplished without the help of staff, friends of the library groups, volunteers, and library board. And I, so I left my position with nothing but gratitude. I was so grateful to have received um, the position in the first place. It was truly an answer to prayer. I had prayed for a job, a part-time job in a little village of Flesherton, and I got it. And it was so, so I was so grateful for that. And I was grateful to have served under such um, incredible and passionate library boards and chairs, grateful to have worked with the staff, and most grateful to have served the community. And I thank you, I thank the community who supported the library, I thank our councils for supporting the, the public libraries in this area. And um, so um, once again, um, I just, I look forward to this afternoon as we um, celebrate the life and work of Agnes McPhail, our first woman elected to the House of Commons. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, our honorees, Jean and Wilda. A familiar face to many of us, a well-known musician and author, Sheila Balls has lived most of her life in Gray County. Always active, she continues to perform regularly on the newest and the newest edition of her book, Our Side of the Fence, is about to come off the presses. We thank Sheila for the enjoyable background piano entertainment that she provided prior to the formal start of this program, and we'd now like to welcome Sheila back to the grand piano to play for us a medley of songs from Agnes McPhail's era. Ladies and gentlemen, Sheila Ball.
Ladies and gentlemen, let's go off, uh, off program for one minute. Sheila mentioned when she was sitting down that some of you may remember these songs. So those of you who are 130 years plus <laughs> will remember them. Other than that, why don't we just do a group trivia contest? And nobody's going to be a loser. We're all going to be winners. I think I identified, and I wish Sheila will confirm this for us. What I'd like you to do is call out the names of any of those songs you recognize. I think I rec recognize Stormy Weather. Was that one? Yes. Good. And My Little Valentine, was that one? My, my something Valentine? Mm hmm you know Okay, go ahead. My funny, funny, funny Valentine. Funny Valentine. Any yeah. others? Yes. Say that one. What's, talk, tell us. Uh, brother, can you spare a dime? Or buddy, can you spare a dime? I'm not even sure. Oh, that was when I was in the Depression. <laughs> well, yeah, me too. I've been depressed for years. <laughs> Any others? Yes. The way you look tonight. Yes, I recognize that. Yeah. Any others? Yes. What is it? Um, um, moon, um, I just... Um, moon glow, moon glow, moon glow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was very and, good. And you only missed one. Which one did we miss? It's in French. <laughs> Darling, je vous aime beaucoup. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Hey, Sheila. <laughs> Nous vous aimons aussi. We love you too. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Sheila for performing for us today, a grouping of the songs that remain ageless. Agnes would have been tapping her toes had she been here today. Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to today's screening of No Bed of Roses. The Political Life of Agnes Campbell McPhail, produced locally using the facilities of Leaking Ambient Studios in Flesherton, this original documentary showcases the voices, photography, and artwork of a number of highly talented people who proudly call this region of Ontario their home. Since its premiere showing last December, some modest image alterations and changes have taken place. So whether you attended the premiere and have, see have seen the, the uh, video once, or if you're seeing it for the first time this afternoon, we trust you'll find it both informative and entertaining. It's now showtime as we present No Bed of Roses. I do not believe in a woman group, much as I believe in groups, but I do believe that women should now come to the House of Commons because they will take direct action. Because they are interested in human welfare more than in making long speeches that are very difficult to follow. Lone woman in the House of Commons. In keeping with her frugal nature, she declined the offer of one of the bigger offices, making it clear that she did not expect any special treatment because of her gender. Upon taking her rightful place in the house, Agnes, though fawned over briefly, was to be treated with hostility by her all-male colleagues. It was a lonely time, and she often wished to have the company of at least one other woman MP. But gradually, in her 19 years in the house, Agnes MacPhail was to earn the admiration from members of her own party and, in time, the respect of the opposition. No small feat for the woman member who was alone in an all-male enclave for her first 15 years in Parliament. Though the lone female MP in Ottawa, Agnes MacPhail's voice was to become a powerful one as she spoke out on behalf of ordinary working men and women. Truly a champion of the underprivileged, MacPhail's political life found her doing much more than fighting for the rights of farmers. She devoted her entire working years to equality, including her support in 1925 for the families of poorly paid Glace Bay miners. But there is no doubt that during her public life as a reformer, Agnes MacPhail's single greatest achievement was bringing about long overdue sweeping improvements to the Canadian penal system. 
MacPhail's various biographers have recognized her 40 years battle to bring about prison reform. Agnes first introduced the need for penal reform in a 1925 Commons debate. In Ask No Quarter, a published biography of MacPhail, her concerns over prison problems and her important work in the penal system area are well documented. Here one also discovers a telling quote that provides insights into MacPhail herself. Following a visit to the women's section of Kingston Penitentiary, Agnes, in a February 1934 House of Commons address, stated, As I face those women, I did not feel myself different from them. I simply felt that I had been in much more fortunate circumstances. Agnes had agreed to see many ex-convicts at her Parliament Building's sixth floor office. Among these was Charles Baines, who first came to see MacPhail in 1929, having just completed a five-year term in Kingston Penitentiary. She was to hear from Baines at intervals over the next four years. And in the spring of 1933, he came to see Agnes and informed her that he was a victim of a, quote, conspiracy and his arrest was imminent. As he predicted, he was arrested. And as a TB patient, he was alarmed at the prospect of his return to Kingston Penitentiary, which lacked the facilities for treatment of tubercular patients. He begged Agnes to intervene, and she sent a private telegraph to an old adversary, Hugh Guthrie, then Minister of Justice in the Bennett government, citing Bain's war record with reference to the tuberculosis condition resulting from his time in the army. MacPhail asked the minister if Baines could be sent to other facilities such as Burwash, Guelph, or Mimico. As the penitentiary system was to be dealt with on the floor of the commons, Agnes asked her secretary to request a file on Charles Baines from the office of the Department of Justice. Despite repeated attempts, the file was not made available. Though barely over an illness, MacPhail moved her resolution that an investigation into the penal system was needed. And in doing so, played right into Guthrie's trap. He then deliberately read aloud from the Baines file a lengthy list of indecent assault and gross indecency charges, none of which was known to MacPhail. Considering the social climate of the time, it was a bombshell. Greatly humiliated, the member from South Grey was to learn that conservative sources in her riding planned a smear campaign around the incident. It is a measure of the lady's fortitude and character that she was to say, If one is warm-hearted and helpful as life goes on, one is bound to make mistakes. I think it is inevitable. But the months that followed were not those of a subdued Lady MP, as with newfound determination, Agnes pushed even harder for reforms to Canada's prison system. At his brother's request, she visited Charles Bain in his Kingston Penitentiary cell, accompanied by the warden. From Bain and others, she was to learn of Guthrie's earlier moves to discredit her while attempting to end MacPhail's ongoing battle for prison reform. It was obvious that a full-scale inquiry into prison conditions was essential. In this, Agnes had accomplished her main purpose. But there was nothing too low for Hugh Guthrie and his cohorts when it came to their serious attempts to discredit Parliament's lone, independent woman member. It was Guthrie, aided by J.D. Dawson, senior inspector of penitentiaries, whose intended smear campaign to ruin MacPhail came perilously close to being successful. Life in the big league of politics, as a young MacPhail discovered, was indeed no bed of roses. On Peace and the Global Village, 1928. One might ask, what is patriotism? Surely it is loyalty to a group, but sometimes we forget that we owe loyalty to many groups. We cannot have too much loyalty, but we can have too much loyalty to one group, forgetting the other groups to which we also belong. 
we are more and more coming to know, that every one of us belongs to that group which is known as humanity, and that we do owe a very great loyalty to that largest group of all, humanity. Scottish ancestry. In her unpublished manuscript titled My Ain Folk, Agnes Campbell MacPhail expressed great admiration for her Scottish ancestors and such family characteristics as sticking to one's principles, which she compared to the foundation of Scottish granite. She went on to reflect on the desperate conditions that forced the MacPhails to leave the village of Kilmartin in the scenic Oban region of Scotland as they emigrated to Canada in about 1846 settling firstly between Galt and Guelph. But upon turning 20, her grandfather, Alexander MacPhail, struck out on foot to Mount Forest, and then east to Proton, to squat on the land that in time he acquired legally. The site was on the 12th concession of the township. As it happened, close by on the 14th concession were the Campbells, Enthralled by their discoveries upon delving into Campbell family Scottish history, Agnes MacPhail again encountered familiar characteristics of courage, determination, and independence. An unexpected discovery involved her grandfather John Campbell, who at 13 won a rare prize for the best letter about a plan for life. Dear teacher, in a few years I will go to America where there are no landlords, and no rent, and no queen. I will get a house of my own there, and a farm, I be two farms. I will have a home of my own, and a farm, before I'm 30 years old, and a wife too, John Campbell. And he did exactly that. First by marrying a local lass, Jean Black, then emigrating to Canada, surviving 10 weeks of horrific weather as passengers on the Heather Bell and the death of an infant son who was buried at sea. Fortunately, by 1855, things were looking up for the Scottish homesteaders and John MacPhail and John Campbell, now neighbors in Protown Township, had become close friends. Their families had much in common and not unexpectedly, MacPhail's oldest son, Dougal, and the eldest Campbell daughter, Henrietta, chose to marry. But not until Dougal was almost 30 and his help raising numerous younger siblings was no longer needed. The newlywed's first home was a pioneer log house, which Henrietta despised, especially in winter when it was cold and drafty and calls of nature meant a trek to the outhouse. But. Agnes, Goethe, and Lillian, the three young girls born to Dougal and Henrietta, delighted in time spent in a kitchen that was both spacious and attractive. By the time she was 12, Agnes' parents had purchased a more conventional red brick farmhouse at Six Corners near Ceylon, a home that could be heated throughout during the winter months. It marked the beginning of an increasingly prosperous time for the MacPhail family. In his meticulously researched best-selling book, How the Scots Invented Canada, popular historian Ken McGowan devoted an entire section to three strong Scottish-Canadian women reformers. One was Agnes Campbell MacPhail. References to her unpublished family history, My Ain Folk, tell us that after the house recessed in 1922, MacPhail sailed to Glasgow then proceeded to Argyle. Here, in an ancient stone church, she experienced a profound presence of her Kilmartin ancestors. Once back in Canada, Agnes, out of a newfound closeness to her Scottish forebears, adopted a change in the spelling of her surname. From then on, she used the ancestral spelling of MacPhail with a lowercase p. According to Rachel Wyatt in her book, Agnes MacPhail, Champion of the Underdog, Agnes would formally change her name to MacPhail in 1925. In response to a newspaper editor's letter asking about the spelling of her surname, Agnes replied from Ceylon on July 8th, 1925. Regarding the business of my name, 
It is puzzling, even to me. My people spell it MacPhail with a capital P, but I write it MacPhail. I have changed it to one word with a small p, and I, I like it better that way. It is easier written and looks better. So be it. Yours sincerely, Agnes MacPhail. 1928. Country living makes for character. And because of the need of character in all national undertakings, and because of the importance of agriculture in our national life, we see how disastrous the results must be if people continue to leave the land. Early years. The eldest of three daughters, born to Scottish-Canadian parents Dougald MacPhail and Henrietta Campbell, Agnes MacPhail was born in a log cabin in Proton Township, Gray County, on March 24, 1890. Only a year before, her father had married the eldest daughter of nearby neighbors John and Jean Jacks Campbell. In the few surviving pages of an autobiography that Agnes began to write in adulthood, we learn briefly of her interest in family and clan history, and we sense her increasing appreciation for both Campbell and MacPhail ancestors. It's here that we discover how her parents began their married life with $800, a team of oxen, and a few pieces of old mismatched furniture. Throughout much of her own lifetime, Agnes was enthralled by the stories of Scotland and of pioneering in the Canadian bush, as vividly recalled by her grandmother Campbell, whom Agnes adored and described as brave and bonny. To young Agnes, Granny Campbell was to occupy an honored place among family members, and her profound influence contributed enormously to Aggie's sense of duty, a respect for family traditions, and a pride in her Scottish roots. So beloved by Agnes was her grandmother Campbell that not even the greatest pressure brought on by a demanding life in politics could keep them apart. At five years old, Agnes MacPhail began her earliest formal school education as a student at the small rural school SS No. 4 Proton, which she attended until age 12. At this point, her parents, having purchased a more comfortable brick farmhouse, made the not-too-distant move to their new property near Ceylon. Here, in a warmer home with inside plumbing, the MacPhail residence quickly became a popular center for neighborly gatherings, a magnet for visiting local farming families. The men's talk, which always centered around farm issues and politics, proved to be much greater interest to Agnes than kitchen matters or children's games much to the disappointment of her younger sisters, Goethe and Lily. Though she adored both her parents, the young Agnes, finding housework of little interest, chose instead to take on farm chores. That put her in the company of her father, who by this time was an increasingly in-demand auctioneer. Craving the education needed to become a teacher, Agnes, at age 14, passed her high school entrance examination, only to be informed that she was needed at home and to put thoughts of further education out of her head. But after two years, her parents relented, and at age 16, Agnes took the 30-mile train journey to enter high school at Owen Sound and found herself in the same room as a Georgian Bay lad who later, as Dr. Norman Beth Hune, became famous for his groundbreaking missionary medical work in China. Young Agnes proved to be a bright and determined student, and in only two years was to obtain her junior matriculation. Her immediate next step found her enrolled in Stratford Normal School. Needing accommodation, Agnes boarded at the time with an uncle and his wife, members of the reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints. Her uncle's strong religious views extended to forbidding dancing. But Agnes dearly loved to dance and found it difficult to feel sinful when dancing won out. But attending the normal school and successfully writing her examination were the steps needed that would permit Agnes to realize her ambition to become an elementary country school teacher. She was about to have her own classroom. On Character, Community, and Country Life, 1925. One of the most gratifying things to me 
is the tremendous love that surrounds me in this community. I hold the trust of the people as my most sacred possession. Nothing else matters. Becoming a school marm. First, you had to get their attention. So reads a chapter heading found in the delightful book, The Little Schools of Grey. The book, published by Conestoga Press in 1982, was so well received as to warrant three printings that year. Historical researchers still welcome this publication by the late Millie Hubbard of Markdale, a valuable source of information on local school days past. Gray County's own Agnes McPhail knew from childhood that she wanted to become a country school teacher. And upon completion of her teacher's training at Stratford Normal School, she found herself in her first classroom at Gowan Walks, four miles east of Port Elgin. McPhail could not be happier, as she not only enjoyed the school, but also delighted in the family she was boarding with, the Gowan Locks. Agnes was thrilled. Finally, her dream of becoming a teacher was realized, and at what seemed like a huge salary of $500 a year. When not teaching, the new teacher quickly found herself immersed in numerous social activities, and in this way, fitted right in, making new friends among the area's farm families. This is likely when it first was rumored that the rural school teacher from Salon taught by day and danced away the evening hours on one occasion until daybreak. Throughout her lifetime, Agnes was known to enjoy parties, especially dancing. Until now, Agnes had got by on very little and knew how to be thrifty. But now that she was a wage earner, she quickly showed a generous side, and it gave her much pleasure on a family Thanksgiving weekend to return home with gifts for her parents and her sisters. Neither parent was pleased, and she was scolded for what they saw as uncalled-for extravagance. Agnes McPhail's second school was at Kinloss, located roughly halfway between Kincardine and Walkerton. Here, she boarded with Mr. and Mrs. Sam Braden, owners of two well-patronized stores. Sam Braden was a staunch supporter of the Liberal Party, and he thrived on political discussions, many of which took place in his stores after business hours. Placing much value on Miss McPhail's opinion, Braden took to involving Agnes in lively gatherings concerning politics and farm-related matters. The year was 1911, and free trade with the USA was a major election campaign issue. The political talk at Sam Braden's store, with Agnes often front and center, often reached the boiling point, energizing Agnes's growing interest in the plight of farmers. However, between teaching and political pot boilers, plus socializing, MacPhail's health so declined that it was necessary to leave Kinloss and return home. She next taught briefly at Boothville before taking a teaching position at Pegg's School near the village of Sharon in York County. Again, Agnes was to enjoy wide acceptance from students and parents alike and quickly acquired the nickname Mac. It was here that she once more became involved with the issues facing the local farming community. And a thought was beginning to occur. As much as she loved Sharon and her school, there just might be more than teaching ahead. On a Philosophy for Life, 1933. One, cut out non-essentials. Don't do things which are of no use to you and give neither help nor joy to others. Don't belong to clubs that are no value to anybody and waste time and energy. Two, be natural. Polish the natural but do not distort it. All great souls are natural and simple. Three, do not rely completely on any other human being, however dear. We meet all life's greatest tests alone. Four, live in the present. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not arrived. Live today. 
Don't live for today, but in today. Finding her political voice. While teaching in East Gwillenbury Township, County of York, Agnes MacPhail found her personal political feelings increasing. She had become focused on rural matters, and she read extensively about cooperatives, systems. Agnes had written a letter to the editor of The Farmer's Son, the Journal of the United Farmers of Ontario, in support of those farmers' wives who provided accommodation for rural teachers. The reply she received intensified her emerging political beliefs. The editor, having recognized MacPhail's potential as an effective voice for the farming community, invited the young teacher to join the United Farmers of Ontario. Her first public speech, entitled Why Farmers Should Organize, lasted 10 minutes. Encouraged by the attention received from men and women in her audience, she soon went on to become known as a greatly in-demand speaker. And as the UFO gained ground, so did her profile and her popularity. Women who were British citizens or wives of military personnel had won the right to vote in 1918. By 1919, they could run for election. Agnes MacPhail's political future lay ahead. A rigorous workload of teaching by day with evenings and weekends given to supporting the United Farmers of Ontario was affecting Agnes's health. In February 1920, after delivering a speech, she was diagnosed with smallpox and quarantined for several weeks. That summer, she resigned from teaching in Sharon and returned to Proton Township to live with her grandmother on the Campbell homestead. She began making pro-UFO speeches in her local township, and her popularity surged. Before long, Charles Ramage, publisher of the Durham Review, suggested that Agnes MacPhail would make an excellent UFO independent labor candidate for Southeast Grey. The UFO political convention was held at the Durham Town Hall on September 26, 1920. With the overwhelming support of the Proton delegates, she defeated the 10 other nominees, all male. The very next day brought protests. A woman federal candidate? A second meeting was held in Flesherton, and Agnes was asked to step down to make way for a man quote, a better choice in the minds of many, including numerous women who went on to say, but Agnes stood her ground and was heard to say, I won fair and square. The young Miss McPhail, the progressive party UFO federal candidate, hit the ground running in an arduous election campaign that found her speaking to voters in all corners of Southeast Grey. Whether it be in halls, big and small, or standing on the back of a wagon, MacPhail's campaign speeches resonated with rural voters. UFO party organizers realized that their candidate was the best communicator for the farming community. However, the campaign found Agnes exhausted by the December 6th election date. By then, she had traveled hundreds of miles by train, horse, and buggy, and occasionally in a car loaned to her by supportive farmers. Overnight lodgings found her under the roof of farmhouses scattered throughout her riding. She lost count of the number of beds on which she slept in her campaign travels. As she made her way home to face the results of the election day, the weary campaigner wondered, Am I to remain a teacher? with an outside interest in politics? But a clear winter day made possible a huge voter turnout, and one by one, the farm community came through for Agnes. Neighbors filled the McPhail farmhouse in a long day's wait, hoping that their candidate would top the polls. A close family friend, Donald Stewart, kept everyone informed as results came in by phone. Until finally, putting the telephone down, he said, Friends, we have made history in the constituency of South East Grey. We have elected the first woman to the Parliament of Canada. To cap a day whose results gave Agnes a place in history, she joined friends and party workers as the jubilant group made their way to the Durham Town Hall to celebrate. The farm vote had won the day. 
the year 1921 was close to an end, and a political future lay ahead for the 31-year-old Miss MacPhail. When I hear men talk about women being the angels of the home, I always, mentally at least, shrug my shoulders in doubt. I do not want to be the angel of any home. I want for myself what I want for other women, absolute equality. After that is secured, then men and women can take turns being angels. Jim Palmer remembers. I was a pallbearer at her funeral, and it was one of the typical Gray County storms um, up in up in Gray, but at Priceville. And we had to, at, after the uh, funeral in the church, we had to carry her casket for two miles down a country road over snowbanks. And there was an old gentleman who had fallen down. He must have been close to eighty. And he said, well, Aggie came in on the storm and she's bloody well going out on <laughs> I don't know how many of you would recall the Charlotte Whitten, who was the mayor of, uh, of Ottawa for some years and one of the really great uh, authorities on child welfare and so on, and not only in Canada, but also in North America. Uh, at Agnes's funeral, there was a large sheet of lilies there which bore the card to the greatest Canadian woman of the 20th century. The signature on the card was that of Charlotte Whitman. At the other end, there was printed an editorial from the Kingston Penitentiary paper called The Telescope. Conditions are far better now, 1954, than in the 1930s, when Agnes McPhail set foot within the old north gate of this institution. The changes wrought within these cold gray walls are her handiwork. To her must go the tribute. And then from a uh, penitentiary on the west coast, uh, we have lost a friend. May you rest in peace, Agnes McPhail. That's who we're talking about tonight, I hope. I hope I can tell you some things about her. She was a very unique person. She had a flashing wit, and I mean a wit. Her audience went, they enjoyed her. Her, her, she could intersperse her speech with humorous things, many of which uh, have become well known in this country. But that wasn't her purpose. Into that wit and so on, she, the real serious purpose was what she was instilling into people. They heard it without realizing it. And it was amazing, the influence that she had on people of that. She had scores of deadly enemies, I'll mention some tonight, and thousands of enthusiastic admirers. She was impatient and persistent, sincere, and devastatingly forthright, impulsive in some fields and painstaking in others. She was so sensitive that she suffered from every slight, so courageous that she could not be halted by the most vicious attack of some of them were abused. She was a great admirer of thrift and an extravagant spender. She was a conundrum, there's no question about that. He had called me 1935 to see if uh, she could see me that day uh, in flesh. Took me out to her home where her mother was and propositioned to me, <coughs> used it correctly, uh, that uh, would I campaign for her. Well, I forgot that the election was going to be several weeks after I was supposed to be back at university. She phoned the university and got permission from the dean for me to work in the campaign. And he said to her at the time, he'll learn far more from you in seven weeks than he will in university in the same, same time. I'm not sure it was true, but anyway, I enjoyed it. It was a real experience. I understood it because she thought what she did was right. And that's the one thing you have to keep always in mind when you're dealing with Agnes McPhail. 
But anyway, uh, he she was on a, a tour of the state speaking. By the way, by this time, she was one of the three or four best, highest paid speakers in, in North America. So she was on her tour there, and she got a telegram from King saying, I am appointing you to go as a delegate to the League of Nations. Agnes phoned back to him, or wired back to him, and said, who else is called? And when she got the list, she said, no way. She told him, no way, I'm not going. You, you haven't got certain groups represented. So King said, well, don't do anything right. Don't make a decision. I'll see what I can do. So he uh, uh, telephoned her the next day and told her that he had appointed three other people who she approved of to go overseas to the League of Nations. Interestingly enough, she went over there. She was the first Canadian woman to go to the League of Nations. Agnes was, had three minutes to reply to that at the end of the thing. And I was sitting in, in a front row down at the side, and there were about 20 reporters from Toronto and elsewhere sitting behind me. And Agnes walked out to the front. I can still see her. She walked out to the front, and she looked at the audience. Out the word. Three quarters of the audience were farmers. This was 1930, the height of the Depression and the rest. Of it. And she looked at me. You want to know? Mr. Bennett did for you. Put your hands in your pockets and find out. <laughs> she turned and sat down. The reporters behind said she's won the election. And yet she, it was forecast she was going to lose the election. She did win. People don't forget those things. This was what at that time was known as the House of Refuge. The poor house. You went there to die. That type of thing. Anyway, Nora Francis goes up and in the front door and says to the uh, uh, a man that was there at her desk doing some work, and she says, uh, can you tell me if Agnes McPhail is here? And without cracking a smile, he says, not yet. <laughs> remarks very much. I'm from Fletcherton. Or? <laughs> Isn't it lucky I didn't say anything about Fletcherton? <laughs> Uh, my name is Banks. My last name is Banks. My first name is Jack. And when I was, I would estimate, eight or nine years old, uh, Agnes would fail, and we called her Aunt Aggie. Agnes would come charging into the house. She called me Little Jack, and she'd say, uh, is your mother here? And my mother's name was Jean, and uh, Agnes always called her Jean, but she wanted her teacup red. <laughs> and I can't begin to tell you how many times she was in our home and she would come running in and say, Gene, you got to read my teacups. <laughs> and I often thought her whole political career was based on <laughs> On Timing, 1948. I realized, too, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose day has arrived. Timing is the thing. For example... Right now, we are passing through an age of social consciousness, and many things are being accomplished now that could never have been done a generation ago, no matter how hard a person worked. Look at family allowances. The time for them had come. And even those who originally fought against them finally voted for them. The MacPhail Landscape Well, it's a, it's a lovely, almost summer-like fall day today. Uh, I uh, didn't expect it, actually, on the first day of October uh, to be so uh, delightful uh, sitting here on the deck as if it's summer with my coffee. It's always a good day when you have your coffee handy. Well, we enjoy life living in a red brick farmhouse. Uh, it's greatly beyond a century in age. And I think that Agnes at one time would have been very familiar with this place. First of all, very close to her school route when she went to school and not very far at all from the former uh, site of her parents' property. Uh, that's near a landmark that's still called Six Corners. And there Agnes, uh, with her two sisters, younger sisters, Gertha and Lily uh, grew up on a farm property and stayed there uh, until they became adults. Agnes, of course, didn't marry. She was pulled in the direction of the political arena. Agnes, uh, in time, bought a lovely little home in the hamlet of Ceylon, a home that is still there. It was once actually the home to the actress, Dan Gordon, uh, who crossed Canada in a one-woman show playing Agnes. 
I first became aware of Agnes MacPhail and her legacy in conversation with David Switzer and Teresa Sears. Currently known for their cabaret-style performances as Sears and Switzer, they have performed professionally for many decades. I was living in Toronto in the 80s, catching whatever work I could as an actor, and there was not much work for women of a certain age in the theatre world. I phoned David and Teresa and, and asked if they could write me a one-woman show that I could own and go on to produce. They told me about Agnes MacPhail, who they had just learned about while teaching and performing in Gray County. I was enthralled to learn about this firebrand politician slash activist. Why did most of my women friends not know of her? I would be honored to portray her. I took out a modest bank loan and hired my writers. Agnes MacPhail seemed to have been dropped from the pages of popular history. Teresa went to the archives in Ottawa seeking original material. She found six boxes. Most of the script derives from material found in those six boxes. The play is set in the reading room of Ottawa's archives. MacPhail comes across the table containing six boxes of her personal archives. Someone is studying her life, it seems. She says in her opening lines, so they've come to find Aggie. And what are the dry bones they will pick amongst? The rest of the script goes on to answer that question, introducing the audience to a history of her rich and consequential life. Over time, I managed to acquire the makings of a traveling theater show and, and even visited a few isolated communities, proud to be bringing these Canadians a piece of their national history. I can't recall how many times I performed the piece during that 10-year period, but do know her story impacted the lives of hundreds of people. Eventually, it became too expensive to continue. Most of those performances were in the 90s. In the early days, I was personally drawn to Agnes's life. I shared her enthusiasm for life, her, her belief in the importance of good work and commitment to community. In some ways, I guess, she became my mentor even though she was no longer with us. She had made an impact on the way I viewed politically the use and abuse of power. And she was so bright and full of fun and, and witty. A pleasure to spend time with. In the 90s, I reorganized my personal life, choosing to leave the city for rural life. I chose Gray County. I also managed to acquire a lovely house near Flesherton. This home was previously owned by Agnes and lived in by her parents while she was in Ottawa. Shortly after, I sold the house to a couple of women who seemed to have a special interest in MacPhail and moved to the small village of Proton Station. Eventually, I moved to the east end of Toronto where I still live. I am now 84 and long past retired. Now outside that home, one can find a plaque. It's a federal plaque uh, erected some years ago by the Canadian government, uh, showing their respect for the lady from Grey. But also, you could call Agnes minimally a three-plaque woman <laughs> because uh, there's a plaque at Hopeville, not that far away from here, a nice little drive through Gray County. And uh, there's a plaque in Toronto in front of her old Leaside home when she, of course, was representing provincially uh, York East, that old riding that has since been swallowed up. Shortly after our marriage, our very first home was in the former borough of East York in Toronto. 
and uh, it's a lovely neighborhood, uh, and we made uh, good friends among our neighbors and quickly discovered that Agnes Campbell McPhail had made many local admirers that to this very day uh, do a wonderful job keeping her memory alive. Now, following that very distinguished federal political career that Agnes enjoyed, she then, as an Ontario MPP, represented her supporters in the old riding of York East. And uh, thanks to some heritage-minded individuals, and some of them are longtime friends of ours, uh, there is both a parquet uh, and a street that bears her name, and the Leaside home that she so enjoyed is still standing, and there's on that site an historic plaque. To their credit, there's a dedicated group of McPhail fans, East Yorkers and Leesiders, who remember the lady with an Agnes McPhail Recognition Award. And that's presented annually to an individual whose community activities embrace many of the concerns and interests that were once so prominently identified with Agnes Campbell McPhail herself. On the art of the insult. In response to a heckler who yelled, Why don't you get yourself a man? I replied, What guarantee have I he wouldn't turn out like you? The Harris Letter. A snowstorm swept across Gray County, thwarting a number of rural voters in the 1940 federal election and contributing to Aggie's defeat. Markdale lawyer Walter Harris's winning campaign was part of the Liberal Party's sweeping majority across the country. Voters sought change, and MacPhail's once solid base had eroded. She was no longer the invincible political force she had been for almost 20 years. Certainly, Harris was a more able and erudite opponent than she had faced in earlier elections. But victory for Walter Harris came with much condemnation for having toppled a legend. This became apparent in an exchange of letters between the newly elected MP and a legal colleague at Osgood Hall in Toronto. Dear Cecil, many thanks for your kind letter. Though, to be frank about it, I'm beginning to wonder if I shouldn't resign and let Agnes have the seat again in view of all the newspaper editorials regretting her defeat. Apparently, the only newspaper in the province that had anything good to say about it was the Windsor Star, and all the rest were unanimous the other way. So, I guess I am public enemy number one. You cannot stop reform. You can try. You can stupidly stand in the path of progress and do all you can to stop it, but all you can succeed in doing is to damn the thing back until it gets beyond control and then causes the very upheavals and difficulties which we all deplore and which none of us want. Final years, final days. Agnes MacPhail's life in Ottawa as a woman MP came to an end when she lost her federal seat to Liberal Walter Harris, a lawyer from Markdale, in 1940. But her political life resumed in three years when, as a CCF candidate, she ran successfully in the Toronto riding of East York, recognized as one of the first two women to enter the Ontario legislature. She was to run again in the Ontario provincial election of 1948 and was the only woman elected. However, now in failing health, she was defeated in 1951. Plagued by recurring bouts of ill health, Agnes MacPhail had much yet to accomplish, but working around the clock was no longer possible. Recuperating from a second stroke in 1952, she found herself $2,000 richer as a result of a winning lottery ticket purchased from her newspaper delivery boy. Taking cash instead of a new automobile, the funds made it possible to visit Scotland. It turned out to be the final trip to the land of her Scottish ancestors. In her declining years and ineligible for a federal pension, making ends meet was a constant challenge. A Senate appointment, which many agreed she certainly deserved, was still being considered by Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent at the time of her passing. 
Word that she had succumbed to a heart attack on February 13th in Toronto's Wellesley Hospital shocked her many friends and admirers nationwide, including inmates of Canada's prisons who mourned their great champion. Honoured by three funeral services in Toronto, Flesherton and Priceville, Agnes MacPhail was buried in the family plot within McNeil Cemetery, Priceville, next to her parents. Interestingly, her name on the family gravestone is shown as Agnes MacPhail with an uppercase P. The day of the burial services at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Priceville is reputed to have been one of the worst Gray County winter days on record. Throughout her lifetime, Agnes had known such storms and political storms as well. She was now at rest, having done more than her share for others. The Canadian Encyclopedia had sent Agnes a form letter to be completed, making it possible for them to update information they had on hand. The letter was located in the hospital, and it was mailed back two days after her death. In printing, barely discernible, it read, Went to League of Nations with Canadian delegation in 1929. Went to Northern Europe, Sweden, Denmark, and Russia with McGill Group in 1937. Spoke from Atlantic to Pacific in USA and in Canada, and also made speeches in London, England. Under special honours or other important facts, she printed... No special honours, except the love of the people, which I value more than any other. By arrangement with Agnes's surviving sisters, Goethe and Lily, and encouraged by women senators and members of parliament, a bust of Agnes by sculptor Felix de Welden was installed in the parliament buildings in Ottawa, 1955. It remains there to this day. Our MP's greeting. Hi, it's Alex Ruff, Member of Parliament for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. I'd like to commend the fantastic work of the Friends of the South Gray Museum for their work in putting together this documentary, No Bed of Roses, Agnes McPhail's Life in Politics. I appreciate the efforts from all individuals to honour not only a local icon, but a groundbreaking force in Canadian politics. Born in Gray County, Agnes McPhail was first elected to represent the riding of Gray Southeast and would later represent the riding of Gray Bruce. Here's Agnes, this bus that sits by, beside me, just in front of the doors to the House of Commons. She worked hard to represent farmers and rural interests in Ottawa. She knew what mattered to rural communities, and she was instrumental in the establishment of old age pensions and the reform of our Canadian prison system. Agnes McPhail's legacy has paved the way for many women in politics and many others. A point I'd like to address is last night, I had the privilege to be at a event supporting our Canadian publishers, and look at the book I was able to pick up. Amazing Women in Canada, Agnes McPhail. She still continues to make a difference today. Once again, I'd like to thank the small but mighty group of volunteers of the Friends of the South Gray Museum for putting this community documentary together to celebrate the achievements of Agnes McPhail. When Agnes spoke. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to take part in this program for Agnes McPhail. You've probably all heard the expression, I would not be the person I am today were it not for the influence of such and such an individual. Well, with regard to Agnes McPhail and myself, I think that expression could quite literally apply. I would not be the person I am today were it not for the influence of Agnes McPhail. As some of you know, my parents worked for Agnes McPhail. My mother in the capacity of a live-in housekeeper and caregiver for Agnes's mother, and my father as a chauffeur who sometimes would take Agnes to political functions like picnics. And it was on one of these excursions that my father met my mother, they fell in love, and the rest is history for the Sinclair family. So it is with particular pleasure that I present this poem to you today as a tribute to Agnes McPhail. And in recognition, really, of all the individuals in this area who 100 years ago 
trusted her enough to put her in a position where someday she would be recognized and designated as a woman of national historic significance. How amazing is that? So I offer you when Agnes spoke. When Agnes spoke, people listened, for her voice was commanding and true, and she used it to champion causes, to accomplish everything she could do, to improve conditions for farmers whose votes catapulted to fame an inspiring soul from Gray County to a leading role on Canada's stage. When Agnes spoke, people listened as her voice rose upward and smashed those barriers to gender equality in society's ceiling of glass. Shards of the past that women today must remember with grateful applause for the lady from Grey, whose vision helped pave new inroads in Canada's laws. On the national stage, many battles were waged and her voice was not always heard. But a change was discerned when colleagues soon learned that Agnes stayed true to her words. She wasn't afraid to have ripples made and with tenacity wouldn't let go. Of situations she saw that contained many flaws and she challenged the old status quo. The conditions in prisons were just one example of compassion for sites she deplored. No one could rehabilitate in such conditions of hate. And the squalor she could not ignore. In the League of Nations, she found a place for her passionate voice for peace. She recognized society's need for reform and defended all colors and creeds. And when hecklers berated her vision or when opposing issues were raised, her humor, blended with a knife-sharp wit, was a trademark approach she engaged. She speaks to us still from Parliament Hill, where her legacy continues to shine in benefits we might take for granted, but her signature is clearly enshrined. Her achievements were many, as she paved the way for generations of women who all need to pay a debt of gratitude to Agnes MacPhail for lighting a pathway and blazing a trail. Yet over the years, her voice seemed subdued in our rapidly changing world. But thanks to the efforts of people with vision, we're remembering our Gray County girl who rose to fame from a humble life without wealth or advantage beyond a pioneer family whose values and guidance shaped a character determined and strong. Thanks to many committees, now road signs exist and a Karen's been erected with credit to Donna Mann. And now this art installation from Holger's imagination. These have all helped Gray County expand the value that's placed on heritage, the awareness that Agnes MacPhail must stay in the forefront forever where all local heroes prevail. They give us hope and inspire us all to reach for the elusive star that guides our personal destiny and raises the excellence bar. Future students will know that generations ago, Agnes rose to the top like cream, thanks to farmers who trusted a woman's voice to speak for their hopes and their dreams. Her voice is now silent, but if she could speak from wherever her spirit now roams, perhaps she might say something like this to folks from her former home. I fought for your rights, so your personal plight would be less difficult than our ancestors knew. Please take up the cause and ensure that our laws protect all Canadians, not just a few. Speak for me now, as the years unfold, and use a voice that's commanding and true, 
then people will listen and will know that you stand behind everything you choose to do. To give to mankind, regardless of creed, the chance for a better life, to possess all the means to fulfill all your dreams. For that was my one wish for you. Thank you, Agnes McPhail. And thanks to each one of you for listening. The Commemorative Banknote. In January 2016, the Arkansas Roots was telephoned by a visual content analyst, Boyd Landstra, at the Bank of Canada with a query to confidentially make a request. Mr. Landstra would not tell me why they were approaching the archives without first signing a non-disclosure agreement. I told Petal Furness, my supervisor and manager at Greerwitz Museum and Archives at the time, that I had been approached with a request from the Bank of Canada for the archives, but I, I first was requested to sign this non-disclosure agreement. She advised that since it was a request for the archives, as the archivist, I should handle it. Even more than the non-disclosure agreement, how excited Boyd Landstra was by the fact that he was required to tell me about the project and the image he was interested in, I pressed upon me that he really was only himself allowed to tell people information on an as-needed basis for anti-counterfeiting purposes. I was told at the time that there were going to be four portraits featured on a banknote, but only that Agnes McPhail was one of them. The bank was very interested in confirming that the image was reasonably close to the time that McPhail was first elected in 1921. The drop waisted dress McPhail is wearing is a style popular of the 1920s. The image has no date written on and the photographer is not known. Joan Burroughs, a great niece of Agnes McPhail, also had an album with the same image that she helpfully allowed me to inspect for a date without me being permitted to divulge the specific purpose, but it too was not dated. Historical detective work continued to find other images with dates to compare general appearance of age, hairstyle, and glasses frames. Boyd Lancer from the Bank of Canada explained that the image would then be used as a reference by an artist in the creation of an etching or line work from which the notes would be printed. Our final preparation work was for Graves to assist with proofreading a document with the essential details of McPhail's life, understanding that the Government of Canada was in a better position to check her dates of service while we could confirm more local details, such as the life dates they were using, were also on her memorial stone. Joan Hislip, our collections register at the time, also reviewed the document simply for a researcher. Then to add excitement, came the hashtag Bank Notable campaign in early spring 2016 to select a candidate for the new $10 note to be released in 2018. This campaign, although for a different note, showed enthusiasm throughout the county to see Agnes McPhail be commemorated. The County of Grey, with the hashtag Because of Agnes social media campaign, other organizations, local media, and individuals alike worked to get the word out to nominate Agnes McPhail for consideration. The story was covered in the Owen Sound Sun Times, Hanover Post, Mayford Express, Flushington Advance, Grapers This Week, Mosaic Magazine. There was disappointment when Agnesson did not make the long list of finalists, although you have probably figured out why. On April 7, 2017, the Bank of Canada unveiled the design of the Canada 150 commemorative note in Ottawa. This note formally entered into circulation June 1, 2017. Thanks to Tim of Leaking Ambient Studios for this phenomenal film. Let's give him a big round of applause.
In listening and watching, it's interesting, there are a lot of historical connections between our current community and Agnes MacPhail 133 years ago. As was mentioned in the video a couple of times, there are many people who actually, whose relatives e either drove uh, Agnes to different events such as campaign meetings and other fundraisers, or who were part and involved with the family. One of them was the St. Clair family out of Ceylon, and the other one, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mary Fowler, was it your dad that also did it? So Mary's standing right, sitting right there. What would really be nice, well stand up Mary, let's give her a recognition and thank her. So her dad also was one of the people involved in, in driving Agnes to different places, and when we break very shortly for uh, refreshments in the other room, you might want to talk amongst each other and we see, we'll see what other links we have in regards to the local history and the past history of this area. Right now, with reflections on Agnes MacPhail and presenting greetings, please give a warm welcome to, of course, our friend and Mayor of Grey Highlands, Paul McQueen. if I'm in the right spot or not. I'm before your little gathering of uh, fruit and uh, drink, and I don't know. They always say that's not a good spot to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know me, Paul. <laughs> I will try to keep it short. Whoops. Um, anyway, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm pleased to be here today to celebrate and remember Agnes MacPhail and to touch on a few things. And I've made some notes to my, uh, my words here today. Just as note, though, is a few quotes I caught there is, uh, live into the day. I think that's so true, is live, live the day, right? And also, ideals whose day will arrive. And I thought, uh, I thought those are some interesting quotes. As many of you know, Agnes became the first female uh, MP over a century ago. She was well known for her progressive pol uh, political, educational, and social views. She championed the rights for women, farmers, miners, immigrants, prisoners, and marginalized people in a time when many of these groups were very, uh, had very little support from any other organization. Her views and efforts often resulted in criticism and people questioning her judgment. But she stood her ground and continued to fight for equity and resolutions to the issues that she felt strongly about. Today, we proudly remember her fighting spirit, her leadership, her integrity, and the road she paved for so many of, uh, who came after her. And we celebrate her, her, Grey Island, her Grey Highlands roots and her positive example she has set for everyone in our community. I have some smaller rights, so I gotta put these things on. Must be getting to that age, right? And they're dirty. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. Maybe I can use them without. <clears throat> so to start off, two Grey County farmers daughters are sitting uh, right in front of here, me today. How fitting this is when we are honoring another farmer's daughter from Gray this afternoon. I'm delighted to be adding my congratulations on behalf of Council and Gray Highlands uh, to Jean and Wilda. Uh, thank you for what you have done in this community and I know I think uh, when I first uh, met Jean, uh, I think you were dressed up as Agnes <laughs> a few times at the museum, and uh, thanks for doing that. And as far as you, Wilda, I know you and I were on that transitional team for Grey Highlands back in 2000 before the amalgamation, so that's where I got to know you a little bit there in the uh, lower room of the old library, and I can't remember the name of that. Help me out. The, it was the room that was dedicated to the millennium. Well, there you go, at the 2000, right? Um, it is, and also I want to recognize Councillor uh, Paul Allen here today from Council. I don't know if there's anybody else here from Council today. I know it's, it's, it's a busy life being on Council, and, uh, but thanks, Paul, for coming out. I would say that it wasn't because of Council, but I know the reasons, definitely why you're here, but that's, uh, I wanted to point you out as well, and along with the other politicians that are here today. It is fitting that we, as a community, annually, annually pay tribute to Agnes MacPhail, she indeed is one of us and is also the most significant Canadian historical figure. But she is more than that. 
The more we learn about her, the more we come to understand her true significance. She, she is our collective mentor of yesterday. She fought for the less privileged in our Canadian society of, of her time, and in doing so, brought through, she broke through barriers. In her, in her legacy, she left us with the blueprint of improving lives of marginalized others. Were she, <clears throat> were she here today, she would be the first to tell you tell her uh, her work is far from finished. It, is almost, it almost seems as though she is asking today's generation to carry on her work. Whether, <clears throat> whether this is the strengthening of the rights for women or the continuing improve the quality of life where needed. We know many of, in our midst have already been involved in such, such activities. And at this time, I would like to have everyone who stand, who is part of the Southeast Gray Museum and part of this Agnes McPhail today and has came from many, many past. So please stand up. Please stand up and be recognized. Again, thank you for all you do. And let this be... Um, an event to showcase those that will pick up the torch and carry on this because it's so important that we continue to celebrate this great, uh, great day of, of Agnes McPhail's birthday and, and all that she has done. Um, yes, Agnes made mistakes during her career, but she took responsibility and learned from them. Yes, she was very sensitive as Jim Palmer told us in the film, as we just heard. But she also took risks and challenges, challenged the status quo. She never gave up. I think that's a, a strong lesson in life. Um, I am looking forward to the continuing of an, the annual Agnes events, continued learning, and uh, as we move forward, I am anticipating further growth of the celebration of the Lady from Gray. So just before I finish up, I do want to say that, um, again, how this event and today has came together very fabulously, that, you know, thanks to Barry and, uh, you know, your lovely wife, that you've pulled together a, a great part of the history that's in front of us here, Jane. And, uh, but, you know, we take a, as our clothing, you take a piece of cloth, you have a piece of cloth, it takes the threads to put it together, and there's the color of those threads. But I also think of today as the weaving of that thread, and I want to think we should give a large round of applause to Terry, who pulls it together every time. So, Terry, thank you. Again, Agnes McFarrell was undeniable, undeniably made in Ontario, Gray County, and Gray Highlands, and it's a better place that we call home. And thanks again for all you do today, so thank you. Thank you, Paul. I've asked Paul not to go too far because, ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the final moments of this uh, phenomenal presentation of this amazing celebration of the birthday of an amazing person. At this time, um, what would a Gray County event be without door prizes? So what I'd like you to do is pull out the little tickets that you got on the way in, and we're going to ask our mayor, along with Steve, to help draw the winning tickets. We have three door prizes which have been donated. One is from the Artemisia Cheese and Fine Foods in Flesherton. The second one is the Bicycle Cafe, which I would take is, uh, is food and a meal. And the third one are beautiful flowers from the Markdale Flower Shop in Markdale. So if you could draw the first one and come and read the numbers. Well, I can see that, that's pretty big. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go for the last three numbers because there's no use going on. 480, 480. Ah, come on up.
So Terry, they must have been poking up somewhere south of here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the second number is the last three digits, 485. 485. Well, Stuart, congratulations. And the winner is 468. 468. Oh, come on down. What does I say about the price of right? You've just been called to the price of right. <laughs> Terry, I got a little story, or a little thing I was thinking about this morning. You know, how it was mentioned that, uh, I think it was Alex mentioned yesterday, uh, we had the uh, political uh, meet the politicians meeting up at Katy, and uh, a lot of the uh, politicians from Gray and Bruce County were at the, ag the agriculture, um, well, Bruce and Gray Federation of Ag hosted it, and it talked about a lot of the events about the farm and what's happening, and it was a good opportunity to have dialogue between the local politicians and the MP and MPPs. And it was a really good uh, event. But you know, you think back how Agnes started it, around agriculture and how still, how important that is in Gray County. And I think it did speak to it being the largest part of the economy in Ontario still, right? So it's still the roots of where we are. And uh, you know, I was thinking this morning, I, yesterday when I was there, my wife texted me and said, you got a new calf in the barn. Ooh. But my kids got it going and helped it, and I got it, was helping get it this morning. But you know, I had to still think back to that time. And I think you mentioned, or somebody mentioned, how she was instrumental of being the oldest on the farm, and how much of a struggle it must have been for her to be pulled away. And it said about her education to be pulled away from that farm, because you can imagine there wasn't like the diesel tractor and you know all that stuff back then. It was all hard, hard work. So. For her to have that uh, fortitude, fortitude to be, to push ahead, to get educated, in own sound, like it was said, own sound, and then move ahead to be that she had some real drive, but again, it had to have support of the agricultural family as well to to move there. So I, you know, it's still there today. So it's just interesting with you know what stands, you know, what Gray County is all about, and you know, I just I just had that thought this morning when I was up there sucking, getting that cab going again. So anyway, I just had to tell that story. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the Friends of the South Gray Museum are pleased to announce that the popular speakers series, which ran before the COVID pandemic very successfully, but had to be postponed at that time, is returning as a live event and live events starting this spring. The speaker events will be held here at Annesley on Wednesday evenings. The first one, get your calendars ready, is scheduled for April the 26th. So the first speaker session will be here on April the 26th, a Wednesday evening. The guest presenter will be the legendary canoeist and wildlife artist, Hap Wilson. He hails from Russo and the Tomogamy area. And then on July 1st, Canada Day, the ever popular Canada Day, Canada Day waffle breakfast will be held at the, Kim, at the Kimplex in Flesherton. Please do mark those dates on your calendars. Now, as we wrap up, an event such as this one takes many, many capable shoulders and hands. We'd like to thank, take, take a moment to thank and recognize those who have assisted. Friends of the South Gray Museum, as well as the curator of the South Gray Museum, Peter Whitehead. The Museum Advisory Board, Stuart Halliday, Peter Ryan, the chair, Colleen Boer, who is with us today, and Stuart's with us today, Emmett Ferguson, Lynn Silverton, Elizabeth Norrington, and Hannah Bowes. We'd like to, of course, thank the Friends of the South Gray Museum, 
Catherine and Steve Plenner, who do a lion's share of the work. Steve is there, and Catherine, where's Catherine? Out there still? Catherine's still working out, out and getting ready for the refreshments. We'd also like to thank Jane and Barry Penhale, Jane Gibson and Barry Penhale, who are the backbone of, of these events. Thank them very much. I mentioned before Tim Riley, leaking ambient studio in Flesherton. He's up in the booth manning all of this wonderful equipment. The municipality of Grey Highlands, its council and its staff, the Flesherton Library, the CEO, Jennifer Morley. We'd like to thank the Community Foundation of Grey Bruce for the funding of grants for this presentation. Coffee and tea was provided by the Highland Grounds in Flesherton. Thank you, sir. He's sitting up at the back. A special thanks to Ansley United Church for the use of these magnificent facilities, to Murray's Printing in Markdale. Thank you to all the community donors. And finally, at the risk of missing someone, a thank you to one and all in the audience today. We now have time and we wish to invite you, one and all, to the Fellowship Hall as we partake in light refreshments, Agnes's birthday cake, tea, and coffee. Now we do need a few minutes for some photos with Jean and Wilda and our guest presenters before the ceremonial cake will be cut and devoured by each and every one of us. God bless you and great grant you a safe journey home. Good afternoon and thank you once again and we'll see you in the Fellowship Hall. Thank you very much.